All right, I think we're live. Uh, so, hey, everybody, this is Russell here alongside Jan. You can hey, say guys. Hi. <laughs> um, and today we are. Oh, shoot, I can hear myself in the headphones. One second. Okay, very good. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, the One Hit Wonders project, which is a thing we did, I guess, a couple weeks ago now. Um, basically, pretty straightforward, trying to find and identify the one hit wonders that are usually it's a term like uh, common in music and see who they are in the world of sports um, and specifically looking at them over the course of a season rather than an individual performance. Um, so I guess to start, if you haven't seen it, I'll just do a quick, very, very quick um, tour of the project itself. And then I guess we'll start talking about it. And if anyone's actually watching this in real time, um, you can drop questions into the YouTube chat channel. Um, if you happen to be on our Slack for Friends of the Pudding, definitely you can throw something in there as well. Um, otherwise, we'll just kind of talk about what it was like making this project. Sound good, Jen? Sounds great. Awesome. Okay. So this is the story. Uh, hopefully, it's rendering on the screen. Um, but basically, we just kind of explain the concept of a one-hit wonder and how it applies to sports. And then it's a pretty kind of templated uh, experience where we go through a, diff a whole series of different sports. So we start with basketball and we feature a player. So in this case, it was Dana Barros, who was kind of the most interesting and the most one hit -ist <laughs> of uh, all the, the people that we found. Um, and it's a little line chart, step chart that shows his career um, and basically uh, they were one hit wonder if they hit the top 20 once in their career and never again were in the top 50. Um, so you can kind of track his career. And this is all according to using an advanced stat um, called VORP for basketball, at least. Um, and you can kind of just interact with it there. And yeah, we had a little toggle here to kind of explain how one hit wonder is defined. Um, and oh, another feature was to compare it to a star player to really show. Um, so you can see uh, this is Reggie Miller and he was really good throughout his whole career to kind of put it in perspective. Um, and then we have a little small multiples of the other players that we found in each sport. Um, and it just kind of repeats from, from, from there on. Um, WNBA, we get into golf and so on and so forth. Um, Anything else you want to highlight, Jen? No, I, I think that's good. Um, I think one of the, the questions that uh, I, at least a, a few of my friends were asking is like, how did we you know, go about limiting the sports? Um, and which ones do we pick the, you know, how do we pick the ones we used? And you know, obviously um, there are a couple of uh, big name ones like American football that are left off. Yeah, I mean, I'll let you answer that question. <laughs> Sure. Um, so we uh, went down kind of through the sports and our big thing that we were looking for is to try to find one all around stat that would allow us to compare position to position. Um, obviously, for individual sports like golf and tennis, it was a little bit easier because we could just compare um, the uh, overall ranking. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for uh, basketball, like you said, we can use four uh, and for MLB, we used war, um, which are, you know, cross positional uh, stats. Mm -hmm. But for football, we didn't find anything that, you know, met the strict data criteria and uh, really kind of we felt was a sound way to measure things. So we went with what we had. That's uh, pretty much exactly right. <laughs> um, and I guess to get started, um... I guess we can talk about the the origin of the story. And so this actually um, was a project. And actually, I think I have some other visual material here. Yeah. So the actual project started um, when we were trying to actually answer the question of who the biggest collapses in sports history were. Um, so you can see here uh, some working headlines uh, clearly have a little bit of a different, uh, I guess, tone than what the piece ended up being. Um, and really, it started with Ari 
kind of wanted to see if we could quantify like Tiger Woods like careers. So he was at the top of his game and then he dropped off dramatically. So um, that's how we were trying to originally answer. And we found that it was actually really hard to, to quantify that because um, there's so many variables across all the different sports that it became a little bit kind of sticky and we didn't really like, I think the results that we were finding, but at the same time, we were finding really interesting results because we were simultaneously looking at who are the people that kind of were the inverse of those Tiger Woods collapses and the people that kind of rose dramatically and then didn't really sustain that. Um, so this is, I guess, pretty unique in terms of the stories I've worked on where I usually stick to my main question or thesis and we kind of pivoted a little bit after we really got into the, the data um, and decided that the collapses was still interesting, but something that we might tackle in a, in a different way. Um, yeah. Did you have any, I mean, I know you were involved in that decision of making Jan. Do you have any other insights to add in terms of like how we made that decision or like when we. Just like that. We, I think the, um, the one hit wonders was a more solid data story. It was mm -hmm. definitely easy to see, easier to see in the charts. Whereas, um, kind of the the collapses story, uh, we would have had to do kind of a lot of uh, anecdotal and more research um, for the reasons behind those collapses, I think, to, to make it, you know, make more sense. Yeah. And I think the other thing we came up with, as you can see, I have like these two elevator pitches here. Um, I think we're still planning on doing this kind of end of career thing, but actually more focusing on how a player, an athlete finishes the career rather than if they collapse or not, because there's actually a lot of different ways that they career can end. It can be very dramatic through an injury or it could be like this really either graceful or ungraceful, um, decline. Um, and maybe we, we kind of want to compare that to what uh, the typical end of a career looks like and find the outliers that might yield other interesting stories. Um, yeah, so I guess that was mostly, the the origin of this um i don't think there's anything else oh i guess something that we did early on when we were working with the data um was to actually visualize it pretty quickly because we knew what we were trying to get out of the story um so we wanted to get it so we use essentially like a visual aid to help us like determine a lot of things because there's no um definitions out there of what a one hit wonder in sports are so we had to kind of come up with that ourselves um, so do you want to maybe walk us through this, Jen, this thing we put together? Sure. So the the biggest question we had was how to define a one-hit wonder. Um, and especially across sports where you have team sports like uh, the NBA or baseball, which have hundreds of players, um, thousands in some cases, and then um, compared to, you know, the, the individual sports like tennis or golf, um, so we thought a lot about how we would threshold kind of defining this uh, this metric of, of one hit wonder and what kind of rank they needed to to make it to be considered kind of one of the greatest players in their respective sports. And then also how far they needed to fall after that uh, uh, or how far they needed to not kind of like uh, reach uh, ever again. So we. You had those uh, the sliders up at the top there, and so we played around um, with those a lot until we ended up on the uh, the twenty and fifty rules that we had for the final project. Yeah, and basically this tool just let us kind of do what you could do with just pure like data analysis, but seeing it is actually very helpful here because half of the the thing in defining it is understanding a player's career. So like we were familiar with someone like Jerry Stackhouse. And so like being able to see his career and like, I think the red line was his like average or the median. Um, it kind of helped us put everything in context to decide like what the right thresholds were. Cause there were some times where there was a player that came in here and we're like, that totally doesn't make sense. So um, I think this was actually really super helpful for us in terms of figuring out what that definition ended up being. Um, so here's a perfect example. I would definitely not consider Yao Ming a one hit wonder um, because his career was actually pretty, pretty solid. Um, even though he only had one like elite season, according to Vorp. Um, 
anyways, so that was um, something we put together and I made this in, um, I use BlockUp, which is a cool little tool to help just do some little D3 experiments and export them to blocks. Um, maybe let's talk about the design. Um, I have the Figma doc open here. Um, yeah, you can definitely lead this one if you, if you want. Sure. So our final design um, was pretty close to the original mock-up. We knew that um, we wanted to have, you know, like a template-based st structure um, where we would kind of lead readers through sport by sport with um, one kind of illustrative example um, with the uh, basketball one to kind of show how we defined a one-hit wonder. We also knew that we didn't want to go through the trouble of like paying and licensing photos, but that we wanted the piece to have a definite like human element so you could connect with people, um, especially some of the more uh, characteristic or charismatic one hit wonders like uh, Dontrell Willis, the D train from the MLB. And uh, he was famous for how he wore his cap in addition to his kind of downfall. So uh, we wanted to create kind of some characters that would tie you to the piece um, and then just create kind of like a, a general wayfinding, like the, the charts themselves are pretty stark um, and, we, and very kind of just geometric and graphical and hit the home the point quickly, but we wanted to make sure that we annotated as much as we could to give you the story behind these one hit wonders. Yeah, and uh, let's see. I had I was I was up there earlier. Um, I guess uh, can you walk me through like your process in terms of so clearly there's like you have a mobile and and desktop layout here. Um, which which one came first for you, or was it all at once? It's for me. I definitely did the uh, the desktop version first, which is kind of backwards uh, of what. Uh, most everybody says to do because um, everybody lives on their phones. You want to make sure that it's most accessible on your phones. Um, but just knowing kind of where we were with the story and how everything was very modular to begin with, that we were going to use a whole lot of repeating patterns um, and a, a template, strong template structure. It was easy to go from desktop to mobile without any large reworks. Um, mm -hmm. So it really, they kind of were, parallel tracks. Um, I did the desktop first, but I was always keeping mobile in my back pocket in the back of my mind. And was there, I guess, anything particularly challenging about this design? Like anything that's when you were looking back on it now, is there anything that was like a pain point or was it super easy? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I think it was fairly easy to execute. Um, for me in particular, I'm horrible at drawing legs on people. <laughs> it's like one thing that I just cannot do uh, for some reason. So and we should point out this isn't your drawing, right? Yeah, these are these are not my drawings. These are actually um, taken from uh, Dribble. That's D R I B B B L E dot com. Of course. Um, so it's a it's a great resource for to kind of like hone in on uh, the style that you want to look, you know, look for in a piece. And there are great illustrators out there and illustrators that you can hire off of that site as well uh, for any pieces. Uh, so I did like the initial kind of version was to have full body things. And then I like stayed up, you know, past midnight one night, just being like, nope, can't do it. Uh, <laughs> wanted to look good and, and, and reworked it. And I think the other thing is once we put it into code, um, we ended up reusing the elements right as the the little the little heads here mm -hmm. for um now that i'm seeing it i lied you have the half body here so we didn't just do heads it's it's a little more than that yeah <laughs> but i think it looks charming um <laughs> uh yeah so i guess um we can talk a little bit uh, about the development itself now um ooh, and maybe we can backtrack and get into some of the data processing because oh look i should turn off my slack <laughs> <laughs> Um, turning off Slack. Um, uh, oh yeah, so sorry. Getting into the code itself. Um, 
I guess there's nothing super remarkable about this process. I mean, we put this together pretty, pretty quickly um, because it really was just um, reusing a singular chart template over and over, um, which mostly mean means we had to kind of have the data on a, uh, I guess, sim uh, reusable structure and format because we work um, doing going across sports. So we did a lot of upfront data processing to make sure everything um, had the same uh, structure and syntax. Um, and that just got a little complicated when dealing with um, different elements. So like so, uh, basketball uses VORP and Jan mentioned that like in individual sports, we use like earnings or rank. Um, so we just had to kind of consolidate all that up front. Um, but in terms of the rendering, um, we, let's see if I have the code here. Um, I don't, I basically just created a reusable D3 chart and we basically, so we could just drop in um, the data and it would figure everything out itself. And so there was really just a single, even down to these charts, they're the same exact code as once up here. Um, just the only difference is we passed it um, a parameter if it was a feature chart or not, and it made a couple of changes. Um, for example, it added annotations, as you can see when I unhover. Um, it had some annotations when it was a feature chart. Um, these small multiples just didn't have that, but otherwise it was all the same code, which was um, pretty nice. And I mostly used, um, what was it? Bostock's um, Bostock reusable chart. This is a thing I, I often reference. Um, yeah, so you kind of start here and just build out a reusable chart um, based on a lot of these kind of principles. Um, and actually I can, uh, open source the repo and I'll drop that in this, this channel. If anyone's interested in what my D3 reusable chart ended up looking like, um, I ended up liking it. So we actually have in our starter repo, which is something that is public. Um, I believe it's now like a template for future projects. So we like to put a lot of stuff in here. So we don't have to, you know, um, reinvent the wheel every time. So this was kind of the generic, uh, format that I went with, um, and with a couple of instructions on how it's implemented, but basically I extended the D3 selection prototype and we can just kind of copy and paste this template to create some other charts. Um, and then it has a lot of the bare bones stuff in there. So like variables that you'll want to track, like within height and selections and basic stuff like that. Um, and then by default, there's only a couple methods. Uh, there's init, which fires once at the beginning, a resize function, a render function, and the data getter setter. Um, and this is mostly what we use for rendering those line charts. Um, I notice I'm rambling about this. You guys can <laughs> check, check this out on your own if you want. Um, so back to, actually, let me open that up again. Back to this. Um, the other thing, actually, do you want to talk about some of the decisions we made, Jen, in terms of like how many things to show and some of the layout choices we made? Sure. So, you know, once we kind of had um, those reusable charts, they were, uh, were really easy to kind of fit into whatever div or whatever box that we needed them to fit in. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we got down to the, the non-featured charts, which are kind of like the small multiple style, uh, we really wanted those to be, um, you know, visible, but not overtake you and, and kind of impede your progress throughout the rest of the sports. So we chose to go with just three o'clock, three across with like a, a show more button, um, and again, this is kind of, it depends on what sport you're in. Um, some sports we found uh, didn't even have any additional one hit wonders. So for like WNBA, for example, there are none. Uh, so that in kind of this templating modular structure, it was easy to say like, okay, we have, you know, our hero, our main chart, um, but then we don't have any small multiples versus like PGA, where we have a hero chart and then lots of small multiples. Um, so we added kind of like that see more button at the bottom there. So you could explore a little bit more, 
Um, or you could just uh, go, you know, skip on to the next sport there. Yeah, and I think that became very apparent, especially when we got to, I think, NHL and MLB specifically um, because of the nature of the sport and the stats. Um, it ended up having, there was a lot of uh, people in here. So it definitely made it sense to to truncate because not all of them are interesting and not everyone wants to scroll through, you know, 20 hockey charts. Um, so yeah, I think that ended up being nice. And then the other thing I actually wanted to point out was something that I haven't done before, but I kind of like how it ended up, which was the, the annotation feature. Um, so for all of these, um, the annotations are kind of important, especially if you aren't familiar with the player. Um, so let's see who's, who was, who one was one that was particularly interesting. Um, let's see, let's pick this guy. So <laughs> rich beam, um, I think just adding those extra layers of annotations really just explains why he was a one hit under and, and maybe some, uh, explanation of what happened to his career. So clearly he dropped off here because, um, he had back surgery. Um, and then the other thing I actually like about this feature is sometimes, especially on smaller uh, screens, the annotations can get in the way if there's lots of data. So there's a kind of tension, right? Between, um, the annotation layer, which is super helpful, but then also being able to explore it. And um, this is the first time I've done it, but I like that when you actually go to interact with the chart, the annotations go away. So they give you breathing room to um, interact with the chart a little bit more. Um, and then when you leave, they come back. So that was something I hadn't done before, but I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it ended up. Um, and then the only other thing to note is Technically, uh, if you're curious, the sticky header here um, basically was like zero lines of code because I use the sticky, the CSS position sticky, um, which is great. It just does all that for you. So you don't actually have to do any work with JavaScript to figure out when this needs to actually like trigger and stick. Um, all you have to do is include the sticky fill polyfill or the sticky polyfill um, because it's not totally cross browser yet. Um, and so that was really cool. And then the only other little note is, and this is maybe a s slightly self-promotional, is for um, when the, the line charts fade in, you used a, instead of using um, like scroll magic or something, I used a library that I actually wrote called um, enter view. So it's super enter view. It's a very uh, lightweight library that does exactly what it sounds like. It triggers when something enters or ex exits the viewport. Um, and that's the syntax. It's really straightforward. Um, and it's super lightweight. So you don't have to use something that's a little bloated and more complex, like uh, scroll magic or something like that. Um, and yeah, so that's the other thing we used. Um, yeah. Any, oh, do you want to talk about your cool scoreboard? <laughs> um, so this was uh, all done in uh, SVG. And the, the process uh, for that was that I kind of drew out the grid in, um, in Illustrator and then put uh, each of these kind of elements on a different layer, which allows you to export um, as an SVG. And the, uh, it'll give each layer its own ID, so you can target it individually. Um, so the, the black kind of background of One Hit Wonders is uh, one layer, the dots that aren't lit up are another layer, and then the dots that we wanted to target are uh, another layer called you know lit dots that you can kind of see there. So once we knew and, and could access those dots, uh, we wrote a function that uh, selects a certain percentage of those um, and then turns a class, uh, CSS class, off and on, uh, or I guess on for a, a certain percentage of those. And uh, the CSS class just has a an animation in it where it toggles between uh, uh, the unlit and the lit color kind of randomly. So that it gives you that flicker effect, which is, um, I think I found that on CodePen actually somewhere. And I'm uh, sure that flicker effect is definitely not coming through in this screen recording, but 
Yeah, it, it's <laughs> in, intermittently there, um, but definitely go check out the, the live link because it's uh, much more impressive. <laughs> awesome. Um, anything else you wanted to, to mention before we, we part ways here? Uh, I think the only other thing maybe uh, is to talk about like how we went about getting the data and, and where we actually got it from. Oh, yes. I it have that. a yeah. lot, a lot of data scraping, which was my my first go at it, and so that's why you can see on the screen here. There's all those like S one, S two, S three. Um, I made Russell label those as the steps, so I could follow along easier, and we chunked it up in kind of more manageable pieces and parts. Yeah. So first of all, this data is available in our data repo um, on GitHub, but in terms of the processing, yeah, you can see. A lot of them, luckily, were from a similar site. So the basketball reference and family uh, website. So the good news is we could reuse a lot of our um, our code when we were trying to pull other data. The bad news is not all the things came from the same site. So like the ATP, we had to get data from uh, this repo. A PGA had its own website, fan graphs for baseball. Um, so we pretty much created scrapers for each thing individually. Um, and the thing that Jan was just alluding to is we actually, you can see here, we kind of created a script for each step in the task because some of them were straightforward, like ATP, where it was just having had the data, we just had to do kind of two steps. Um, and I'm usually a big fan of um, separating each kind of step into its own script just because it makes it a lot more manageable because some of these scripts and especially with scraping um there can be like lots of steps to it and so i think by breaking it down um, it just makes it a lot easier to keep things in order and know what's doing what um and so like you so you can see just quickly here this um step all it does for lpga is runs through all the years in our range, and then it downloads those HTML pages locally. Um, and that's something I, we like to do because then we don't, every time we rerun it, if we want to just tweak a tiny little thing, we don't have to re-download that page. It'll actually exist um, locally. So then we're not just like constantly bombarding uh, like the LPGA site with requests. Um, so we have that HTML here. So it's, then we can just parse it locally. Um, and so yeah, that's just kind of the whole nature of the thing. So the first step for LPJ was to download the, each page for each season. Um, then we had to go through and extract all that data from the web page. So I use a library called Cheerio. Um, and then the last step was to take all of those things and put them together into one nice and tidy data set. And you can see some of these sports, uh, which one was the worst, Jan? I think it was NBA and probably MLB. Um, there were just like, a, I think, a few, you know, more players. Um, and then a few hiccups on uh, whether or not something was visible on the site that we needed to scrape. Right. Yeah. So each one, data scraping is always, a, I mean, that's like a whole, could be a whole day's lecture. Uh, there's so many nuances with data scraping. Um, but for the most part, sports data is pretty nice because it typically uh, is in very structured format and there's lots of it out there. So at the end of the day, we were able to find everything we were looking for, which was, which was nice. Um, yeah, anything, anything else <laughs> worth adding about this? I think that's it on my end. All right. Um, so I think that'll do it for this. Um, maybe next time someone will have questions, but... Uh, otherwise, uh, definitely check out this project and, um, I guess we'll see everybody next time. Thanks, Jen. Bye all. Bye bye.